Good morning, Linda. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, Russell. Happy Easter. Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter Pastor. seeking God's love and grace. We welcome all because God welcomes all. We encourage young children to participate and make their presence known. We come from a wide variety of places on earth and individual spiritual journeys. We are many races and cultures, different sexual orientations, gender identities, and families of various configurations and single people. We are various stages of life, differing abilities in health and economic circumstances. Our unity is in Christ, who calls us to reject division and discrimination. Let's thank the choir again for that beautiful music. Thank you, choir. It wouldn't be Easter without that magnificent trumpet. Chip, thank you so much for that beautiful music. And Claudia, who's here every Sunday doing such a wonderful job. Thank you, Claudia, for being such a wonderful job. Acknowledging people, um, have anybody seen the, the movie Elf? So there's a scene in Elf, uh, is his name Buddy, Buddy, Buddy the Elf? There's a scene where he stays in Macy's all night long and he decorates the entire store magnificently in one night. Um, so if you saw when you came in the balcony, has, that was all done by one person uh, just done last night. And I'm not allowed to say who it is. And I guess I won't say who it is because I'll hear about it when I get home. <laughs> and the Altar Guild, look at the wonderful job the Altar Guild did, and they had help from the yoga crew. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, Carlton Pearson was a famous televangelist. 
For me, growing up a Catholic in New York, I didn't know much about televangelists. They all seem to have been from a different part of the country. Maybe some of you recognize his name. He had a meteoric rise, and then often with sudden rises, there is just as sudden a crash and turn down. He started his own church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it grew in Sunday attendance to thousands. And he had a weekly broadcast that was nationally shown. He was one of the very first African Americans to have a preaching uh, venue that was nationally broadcast on television. He had attended Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, and Oral Roberts himself took him under his wing. Like Oral Roberts, he was Pentecostal, a tradition that barely begun 100 years ago and just grew to an overnight global denomination. At the height of his popularity, when Carlton Pearson became Bishop Pearson, he had a crisis of faith. He had an uncle who failed to become born again, and when he died, Pearson was faced with the notion, based on his beliefs, that his uncle had gone to hell. Soon after that, he was watching a program asking people to help famine victims, and Pearson was confronted again with his belief that there were thousands of people, many of them children, who he believed were going to hell. That's what he was taught. If you didn't proclaim that you had a born-again experience and accept all the teachings and doctrines of the Pentecostal Church, to him, to them, you were going to hell. As Pearson was confronted with the implications of this teaching, he turned to God in prayer asking God to help him to save these souls that he thought needed him to go and to save them. It seemed impossible that he could reach all the people in the world who needed to be saved. Watching these famine victims, he just couldn't bear to think that they hadn't been saved. Gesundheit. All the people dying each day without having accepted Jesus. And then in his distress, he turned to God in prayer. And he experienced an epiphany. He came to believe that there was no hell. He felt sure that God's salvation was universal. And he found Bible verses to bear this out. So he got up into his pulpit before his congregation of thousands and told them that his crisis was resolved with a blessing from God that Jesus had indeed died for all the people of the world. The reaction was swift and negative. He found out that hell was something his congregants would not allow him to deny. They would not hear it. Pearson told them the Bible verses that he had found to support his claim of universal salvation. He called it a gospel of inclusion. He no longer believed that gay people were going to hell. He felt affirmed by God in his soul that there was no hell. Of course, for every Bible verse that tells you about universal salvation, there are others that sound much more restricted. If you know our creed, our church creed, that says that Jesus descended into hell, so it's kind of there in our statement of faith. In the Bible, the Hebrew word is Sheol. It's often associated with hell, but it simply means abode of the dead. The word in Greek that speaks of this place is Gehenna. It describes a place of punishment. The Apostles' Creed, which says Jesus descended into hell, does not use either one of these words that we find in the Bible, which is where we get our understanding from. The Apostles' Creed, we find the statement, he descended into hell, using the Greek word Hades. The word Hades in Greek refers to an underworld, a place of the dead. It could be translated as he descended to those below. It does not say a place that we recognize today as hell. It refers simply to a physical state of death. If you look in our bulletin, if you look in our worship book in your pew, you will see that our creed 
now actually says to send it to the dead. Our old worship book, the Green Book, used to say Jesus descended to hell, and then there was a little asterisk and a little tiny footnote that said, or he descended to the dead. And now if you look in the Red Book, it says Jesus descended to the dead, and there's an asterisk and there's a little tiny footnote that says, or he descended to hell. So they flipped the footnote with what's in the text. So modern usage of these terms from 2,000 years ago has changed. We have to understand the way we think about a word today and what it was meant to mean as it was originally put in there. After the Apostles' Creed was developed, there was another longer version, the Nicene Creed, which we also use on occasion. The Nicene Creed doesn't even mention this at all. We are Lutherans because 500 years ago, scholars started reading and translating the Bible. At the time, people were only allowed to read the official, the Latin version. But some rebellious scholars started going to the original languages, the Greek and the Hebrew, and questioning the best way to translate and comparing the various manuscripts. And they were translating it into new languages, not just into Latin. Erasmus was one of the foremost scholars in that time. And he said that the official translation from Matthew's Gospel, the official Latin translation, was wrong when it quoted Jesus as saying, do penance, because it should be translated, according to Erasmus, as repent. This one word is the difference between a faith based on salvation gained by following rules and rituals to a faith that called upon us to turn our lives around and see God's presence in the world and to live out our faith in our involvement in the world every day. The church denounced this translation as false and its implications as heresy. Martin Luther and many others were put on trial and denounced as heretics unless they renounced these and other reformed notions. That was 500 years ago. Carlton Pearson was put on trial in 2004, and he was declared a heretic. If we don't question the different possible translations and interpretations, examine them and study them and debate them and discuss them, that means that we have just been schooled in one particular interpretation. Someone has told us their interpretation and we have accepted that as the only one, deciding that it isn't an interpretation at all. It's the only way that the text can be read, which is almost never the case. This kind of approach is accompanied by threats that would cause us to fear. These threats are necessary for people to maintain their power and authority, to manipulate our understanding and our refusal to consider any alternatives based on what they're teaching us. If you think about it, these people who are insisting that there is a hell, they're also positive that they're not going there. There's an expression, right? I'll see you in hell. Has anyone ever said that? I don't think those people who are condemning Pearson and anyone else, I don't think they believed that they were going to hell with him. They were sure that other people would be landing in hell. They are certain there is a hell and they are just as certain, more certain probably, that they know how to stay out of hell. So if we start to shake that foundation of theirs, now they're thinking, maybe I don't know how to avoid hell if what I've been taught is not accurate. And denying hell sounds like a sure way of ending up in hell to them. I choose to believe that God does not send us to eternal punishment or purgatory or a temporary punishment. And most of the reasons that people talk about, like in terms of marrying the wrong gender or 
not being married at all, those things that people talk about, not being a Christian, not being born again, those reasons that people give for why they think somebody would be in hell, they don't sound like things that deserve of any kind of punishment. Carlton Pearson died last year, his faith in universal salvation intact. When he refused to renounce his remarks about there being no hell, his congregation of thousands abandoned him. They walked out of the building. He was denounced by his peers, by his mentor. So there's a movie about this. Has anyone seen it? Just a new movie out. Come Sunday. If any of you are interested, if you'd like to write to me to tell me what you think, any of you are interested, just write to me and tell me, do you think there's a hell? Did you used to think there was a hell? Did you change your opinion about hell? And when did you change it? And how did you change it? If you watch the film come Sunday, I'd like to know if it's given you something to think about. We have a complicated story with God. Our relationship with God is complicated. A professor of mine in seminary once said, the Bible is the story of humanity refusing to be loved by God. Many people see God as having a conditional love. If you do this, God will love you. If you do this, if you believe this, then you'll be saved. If you believe these five statements, then you will go to heaven. If, then. The problem with if-then theology, the real problem with it, is that it automatically becomes us and them. You okay? Yep. Sorry. Nobody's injured? No, nope. everybody's okay. If-then theology becomes us-them. We who are saved, we who are doing what God wants, we who are following the right rules, and them who are not. If-then means us and them. We who are going to heaven, they who are going to hell. Doesn't this theology that's built around hell simply mean God loves you and if you don't love him back in the right way, then or else. It's kind of an or else theology. For anyone who is thinking that millions of people, billions of people over history are going to hell because they're not doing what God wants, that God has set a condition on them, there's just one word, grace. Grace, God's unconditional, unmerited love. 